All right, let's see if I can do this in one breath. Cover structure, water clarity, forage, reaction bait, junk fishing, finesse, flipping and pitching, slack line graphs, points, humps, ledges, shelf, creek channel, pocket, drains, ditch, flat, bluff wall, transition, rock, sanding timber, laydowns, grass, docks, power fishing. Holy cow. Oh, that's just too much. If you are getting into bass fishing and are just confused by what all the terminology means, this is the video for you. I'm gonna sit right here and walk you through what all the terms of bass fishing mean so you can become a more well-rounded and educated angler and therefore catch more bass. My name's Tyler, and let's talk about it. Another giant, another giant. Look at that, y'all. I can't believe what I just caught. Yes! Now, am I saying that you have to have an intricate understanding of all these bass fishing terms in order to go out there, wet a line, and catch a fish? Absolutely not. But, and there's a big but here, if you truly want to become a better bass fisherman, having a well-rounded understanding of the environment you are actually wetting a line in will in turn make you a better bass fisherman, whether you fish in ponds from the bank or in a fancy bass boat on a large reservoir. This video is for everyone. So let's jump in with the first term. I'm gonna grab my phone here so I get the notes proper. The first term that I think every angler needs to understand, and that is cover and structure. Now, I am guilty here on this channel, in my videos, of mixing up those two terms, but they are technically different terms. Cover is the, uh, the habitat, I guess you could call it, that bass live around, around the surface. So cover would be lily pads, cattails and reeds, boat docks, any kind of uh, wood, like lay down logs, we're gonna talk about all those here in a bit. That is all cover because it is stuff the bass could live and make their homes in that is around the water surface. I'm not saying it has to be totally above the water or breaching the surface. It's not as if when the water rises or a wave splashes over, that piece of cover all of a sudden is no longer cover because it's underneath the water. If you're close to the top of the water column, that is what I would consider cover. Now, structure is the exact opposite. It's on the bottom of your body of water. So I would say brush piles, rock piles, underwater aquatic vegetation, that is for the most part structure. But one thing you should know about cover and structure is they both hold fish. And matter of fact, I fish cover and structure nine, maybe like 75% of the time that I'm catching a bass. The rest of the time I'm going after fish that are in what's called the water column. Now I've had several comments about this recently. I felt like it needed to be included in today's list. The column is just however much water you have from the surface to the bottom. So the water column could be six inches deep. It could be a foot deep, could be 450 feet deep in some lakes out there like Lake Tahoe. I mean, the water column is just that depth of water. Now the strike zone is oftentimes a much smaller section of the water column, but anytime I say that word, water column, that term, that means however deep the water is. And so the water column when you're fishing a square bill is gonna be a lot shallower than the water column when you're fishing a drop shot per se. Now staying on the vein of water, I wanna talk about water clarity because that has a huge impact on the lures you choose and the places you decide to fish. Now I'm gonna kinda of rewind that for a second. You may not actually have a choice when it comes to water clarity because maybe you live in a place that only has two or three ponds or one body of water or that's all you've had the chance to fish so far. You haven't had the chance to explore and drive somewhere else. But the number one thing I'll say about water clarity is that the two extremes, extra, extra clear water and extra, extra dirty water are very difficult to catch fish in unless the fish are very unpressured. Water clarity is just how far you can see in the water. Now, water clarity is not just due to the amount of particles, the amount of dirt, the amount of stuff in the water. It is also due to how much light penetration you have. So I don't care how clear your body of water is, if the sun is not out, AKA it is 2 a.m., you're not gonna have any water clarity because there's no light penetration, the sun is not out. So same thing kind of goes on cloudy days. If you have maybe a partly cloudy day, you're gonna go through periods where your water clarity is better and then worse. And then maybe one day you're gonna have clear water, but then a front blows through and it makes all kinds of waves and makes the, the water just get dirtier because it drags dirt off of the bank into the water column. Therefore, you had good water clarity and now bad water clarity. Now, do the fish bite better in one versus the other? That is all body of water dependent. So it all comes down to where you fish. You've got to find out where the fish on that body of water on that day like to sit. Sometimes the entire body of water is the same. And other times, depending on weather and maybe algae bloom in some places, you may have one area of your body of water that is clearer than another. You just got to test out both to see what the fish like. 
And now generally, I'm gonna talk about color selection real quick for your lures. If you have dirtier water, you're gonna wanna go more to the extremes. So the, um, the blacks, the black and blues, the chartreuse, the straight bone whites. That is better, in my opinion, in the dirty water. And then in the clear water, you want to go more towards your naturals, your green pumpkins, your watermelons, your, your kind of light browns. Those are better for your light uh, water conditions. Can you catch fish if the water clarity changes? Absolutely. You just may have to adjust the lures you throw and the speed and depth at which you throw them because the fish are always changing, especially with changes in water clarity. Now, when talking about lure selection, let's talk about my next term, which is forage. And the basic definition of forage in bass fishing is what are your bass eating? Are they eating bait fish? Are they eating bluegill? Are they eating crawfish? They could be eating a mixture of all those things, or they could be eating none of the above, and they're in some weird body of water that has freshwater shrimp or freshwater jellyfish. Who knows? Their forage is what the bass are eating, and that's up to you to figure out what it is. Now, can you still catch fish on a lure that imitates something your bass are not eating. Of course, a bass is an opportunistic feeder. If it sees something that looks injured or it just feels like eating it or it triggers a reaction, we're gonna talk about reaction strikes here in a second, it's gonna eat it. And so if you have a crayfish eating bass and you put a bluegill imitation swim jig or a, a big shad, gizzard shad swim bait by it, is it gonna eat it? Potentially, but in my experience, it's best to try to know what the bass are eating in your body of water. And you may not know the first time you fish there. It may take many times and looking in the water, maybe setting out a bait trap to actually trap what kind of forage is down there in the body of water. I've done that before. By doing that, you'll have a better understanding of what the fish actually see. And it is almost always better to do what's called match the hatch. That means select your lure size, presentation, and color to as best as you can uh, imitate what those bass are eating, and that is what forage is all about. And my next term is something I mentioned just a second ago, and that is the word reaction. I don't care where you fish, reaction baits can catch bass all over the country. Matter of fact, all over the world. And it's not like a reaction bait is just a bass fishing lure. Every type of fish can be reacted into eating. What that means, the fish is not in a feeding mood, but your lure goes by them in such a speed or with such a size or noise that they almost have no choice biologically but to turn and strike that lure. That is what a reaction strike means. Now, this is usually caused by a fast moving lure, which we're gonna talk about here in a second with reaction baits. Actually, you know what? I'll jump to that term right now. A reaction bait is a lure or a bait that is moved relatively fast. So, topwater plopper, reaction bait, vibrating jig, Reaction bait, Ned rig, not reaction bait. We're gonna talk about that here in a second, what category the Ned rig falls into. So you've got spinner baits, you've got crank baits of, of both a lipless and the build variety. This here's a Strike King Hybrid Hunter. All of those are in the moving bait, AKA the reaction bait category. Now you can retrieve them in a very slow way where maybe in clear water, the fish can actually get a better look at your bait and eat it, not based on reaction, but based on actual feeding and predatory behavior. I'm talking about though, when you're retrieving it so fast, past a stump or down a, a grass edge, the fish is there, it passes by and bam, it eats it because of the reaction strike. That's what reaction baits tend to mean. The next term is not reaction baits and that is Finesse baits. What is finesse fishing? Well, the term finesse just in the English language, I'm, I, sh I should probably actually look that up. The definition of finesse is to do something in a subtle and delicate manner. And that's exactly what finesse fishing means. They are subtle, they are delicate lures because there are many times, especially in clear water, when a bass needs something subtle, and delicate. So I'm talking about lures like a drop shot, wacky rig, Nico rig, Ned rig, as this one is here, shaky head spy bait, jig head minnow, and basically any kind of variations off of those lures. But finesse lures can also be smaller variations of larger styles of lures. So this here is a big swim bait. It is a seven inch swim bait. Is this a finesse lure? Absolutely not. But can I take this lure and downsize it to maybe one or two inches? 
and that becomes a finesse lure? Yes, you can. So I'm talking about little swim baits on a jig head, finesse crankbaits, usually an inch to two and a half inches long, finesse topwater poppers, and if, you know, topwater walking baits, small little finesse. I, I, the one that comes to mind is the bitsy jig, a small little jig. On one end, you have finesse fishing. On the other end, you have reaction bait fishing, and there are lots of lures that kind of can cross in between the two. Now the next bass fishing term actually uses finesse fishing and reaction bait kind of at the same time, and that is what I like to call junk fishing. And my definition for this is using the conditions and habitat types in front of you to constantly make decisions about what lure to throw and when. Now in my opinion, only advanced to expert anglers can actually junk fish well, and the reason is because as you're going down the bank, again, bank fishing, kayak, bass boat, john boat, whatever, you are using, in this type of fishing, you are using your eyes and sometimes your electronics, forward facing sonar, to make decisions constantly about, okay, that looks good for this lure. Up there, 50 yards from now, I see a dock. I could pick up this rod and skip it underneath there and use that lure. But then the bank changes from dock to actual rock and grass. And actually it looks like it slopes out into a point. And so I could back off and throw a vibrating jig here and then a top water there. That is what junk fishing is all about. And if you don't have a good understanding of kind of, I'd say like 80% of bass fishing lure types and where they should go and how, and you've had experience doing that, junk fishing is going to be incredibly difficult and you're probably gonna end up throwing two to three lures all day. But if you understand how lures work and where they should work best, you can look, as I talked about, at the conditions and the habitat types in front of you and you can make constant decisions. And when I say constant, I mean, sometimes you're making like two casts with a rod, putting it down and picking another one up just for one flip or one cast that way, and then putting that rod down and picking up a third rod, or you're switching lures with a clip extra fast to, again, to fit the conditions in front of you. I think junk fishing is one of the best skills you can possibly learn. Now, is it possible on every lake or every pond out there? No, some of them are super monolithic. They look the exact same throughout the pond or the lake, but if you have a variety of covers, structures, and conditions on your body of water, junk fishing is something you need to learn to do. But of course, in order to do that, you have to learn the rest of the lure. So that is junk fishing. My next thing that, again, kind of has to do with junk fishing oftentimes is flipping and pitching. We use these terms interchangeably. They're technically not the same thing. Flipping is an old school technique where you grab the rod, you grab the line with your hand, you pull it, and you pendulum swing that lure and then let go with this hand. Grab the line, swing it, let go. Grab the line almost like you're fly fishing. That is not the majority of, I mean, matter of fact, I haven't seen any pro anglers or YouTubers do that in a very, very long time. The majority of the time, we are now doing just pitching, where you are using the pendulum swing of the rod, clicking the button on a bait caster or, or, or opening the bail on a spinning rod, and you are, you, I say flipping, you are pitching the bait out there. Now, you're, you're gonna hear me say flipping and pitching or just flipping. To me, the terminology I know is different from the techniques themselves, but I don't care, to be totally honest. I'm gonna keep saying flipping and pitching, even though they are different things. To me, I don't do any traditional flipping, I just do pitching, but I'm gonna call it flipping because I don't care. Now, going along with all that is going to be the term power fishing. Power fishing and covering water are kind of synonymous. So when I say that in my videos, I'm talking about fishing stuff that's fast. So your crankbaits, your spinnerbaits, your vibrating jigs, or or I would say skipping a jig under overhanging trees or underneath boat docks, as long as you're doing it relatively fast and not being ultra slow, ultra finesse with your presentations, that is going to fit into the power fishing category. You are just chunking and winding, chunking and winding, plugging away, casting at stuff you see with your eyes and or forward facing sonar underneath the water. You're just going ultra fast, fishing whatever you see and hoping to pick up a few bites along the way. Power fishing, usually not the way to catch the biggest bass in your body of water, but it's definitely something to do if you want to, again, cover water with your lure as you work the bank, uh, you know, walk on the bank or in a bass boat or a kayak. Power fishing is a great way to just understand more about where the bass are in your body of water and catch a few along the way. Next term, we have slack line. And this is when your rod tip 
is not tight to your lure. Your, your line actually has some slack in it. I feel like it's a, it's a generally pretty easy definition, but if you don't do it correctly, you may lose out on a ton of fish because for the most part, I have found on lures like a jig, soft plastic, Texas rig, you want them to fall on a slack line, which means you cast out there, you peel out some line. That way when the bait hits the water, it can actually fall totally vertical. Are there times when I've caught them when I want the bait to not fall on a slack line, therefore I want the bait to kind of slowly pendulum down? I've done that, but I just don't think it looks the most natural and you lose out on casting distance when you do that. So most of the time when I'm hopping a Texas rig or a soft plastic, whatever off the bottom, I am hopping it therefore creating slack in my line, letting my bait get back down to the bottom, and then I'm reeling in my slack to have no slack line. Now, when you set the hook, you don't want slack line. You want to reel your rod tip down to get rid of all the slack line and then set the hook, but that I feel like slack line just should be understood in the sense that you want slack line when retrieving your baits that are on the bottom, but when you're going to set the hook and or retrieving baits that are not on the bottom, spinner baits, crank baits, vibrating jigs, top waters, whatever, those you don't want slack line. So if you're working a top water frog and you've got a little bit of wind over a lily pad field, and you kind of let the line get carried by the wind, that slack line is gonna create a bow or from your, basically you say your frog is here and you're here on the bank, your line could bow around some, some, some cover, some cover, and when you go to set the hook, you're not gonna have a strong hook set because your line is all the way over here. So if I'm fishing, especially in wind, I'm gonna cast and immediately slam, my, I say slam, bring quickly my rod tip to the water so there can't be any slack in my line. Then I'll peel some line out to let it sink down to the bottom. I just wanna have the least amount of slack in my retrieves as possible besides letting baits fall naturally down to the bottom. So at this point, I feel like I've discussed most of the terminology in bass fishing that every type of angler has the experience of. So bank fishermen, kayak, John boat, everybody understands all of those. As I move on to some of these other ones, if you're a bank angler, it might not exactly apply to you, at least from the start, but do not tune out because I believe some of these terms especially can help you catch way more bass from the bank. So my next term is going to be graphs aka electronics. Those are your fish finders. Hardly ever are they called chart, chart plotters anymore. They were in the past. And in using those on your fishing watercraft, you're able to actually tell what's down there on the bottom through a variety of different kinds of sonars and mapping, which mapping is a very, very crucial next term, and that's topographic maps. I'm gonna talk all about topographic features here in the next few minutes. So if you are unaware of how to study a topographic map, some of the images I'm going to show here might not immediately make a lot of sense. So maybe pause this video and go learn about that and then come back here and finish because I promise it is something worth understanding. Even if you just fish from the bank, you can use topography as your bank fishing to help you make better presentations and catch more fish. So the first topographic feature in your body of water, I don't care where you fish, is going to be points. I believe that points are the best place to catch a bass. Matter of fact, I have a points masterclass I'm working on here for the channel that's gonna make a super deep dive into fishing points. Now, sometimes points can be very obvious. You're fishing down the bank and you look and you're like, man, the, the actual bank line slopes down in a V form that's probably a point that continues on into the water underwater. And for the most part, you're probably right in making that assumption. But many times there are actually underwater points that you have no idea exist unless you had some kind of map of your body of water, a topographic map, or you've just thrown enough lures out there and counted down how far they sink to therefore know, okay, it's deep there, shallow there, and deep there. So that's probably a point right there. That's the way, kind of the, the layman's way to find a point. The best way is to use your fish finders or your maps, but at a pond, you sometimes don't have that liberty. Now, points can either be slow sloping or fast sloping. So again, use my hands here. They can slope like this, or they can slope like this. 
Either way, they are both points, and I'm sure I've put plenty of stuff on uh, on the screen of both actual images from above the water and what topography looks like underneath. That is a point. Everybody should be fishing points, even in ponds, as you see on this drone shot right here. This point, at least from standing on the bank, does not look like it goes as far out as it truly does, but by having an aerial view, I was able to understand way more about this body of water and catch more bass. So points, something to understand. Next term when it comes to offshore stuff is going to be humps. A hump is just a circular-ish rise off the bottom. Imagine taking a bowl, flipping it upside down, placing it on the table. The table is the bottom of your body of water. The hump is the bowl. It's kind of an easy way to understand it. It looks like this here on a topographic map. It also looks like this, and it can kind of look like this. I would also call that a point. The next underwater bass fishing term is going to be a ledge. Now, a ledge is nothing but a quick drop from shallow to deep that kind of slopes on each side. So shallow to deep, quick drop, not necessarily a ledge. But if it has bottom here and kind of a, a topper edge here, again, it goes from here down there. That's your ledge right there. Now, it differs from a shelf in that a shelf is usually related to a rock bank where you have maybe a, a quick 90 or 85 degree drop in the rock and then immediate 90 degree turn and then it drops off again. So ledge here, there, there, shelf there, there, there. Kind of similar, but a little bit different. Again, understanding the, the differences between the two definitely helps you when you're watching, let's say, a pro bass fisherman on Bassmaster Live or MLF Live talk about those things. That's what they're talking about, a shelf versus a ledge. Ledges usually are a little bit deeper than shelves are, but again, they can kind of be interchangeable terms, and they can both hold bass, as I talked about. Now, the next thing that is super crucial, especially for those of us who are fishing man-made bodies of water, is going to be a creek channel. Now, most of our bodies of water in the United States, where I'm based and where most of my viewers are based, most of our bodies of water are man-made. So they were originally farmland that had maybe some creeks and rivers flowing through. They built a dam, they let the water rise, and therefore, when you look at the body of water, you just see a flat lake. But underneath, there are all kinds of topographic changes depending on the uh, terrain that was flooded when they made the lake. And at the very bottom of all of those is going to be the original channels of the rivers and creeks that were there before they ever flooded the lake. And the bass and bait fish, the whole ecosystem, uses those regardless of how big your body of water is. Could be a one-acre pond or a... 10,000 acre lake, bass are going to use those as highways to move throughout the seasons as they go from shallow to deep in the summer, spring, fall, and winter. Creek channels are especially important, not just to fish actually in the channel, but to know where they run. Therefore, you know where the best places to fish are. So when it comes to creek channels, they can be very defined, as in uh, it has a ledge or a shelf that drops into the creek channel, and you can see on your map, man, I see it runs this way and then that way, and the, the bass are gonna be sitting in those at certain times of the year. But other times, depending on how old the body of water is, I'm thinking about a lot of Texas bodies of water that have just kind of at this point, 60, 70 years old, they've kind of silted in. So all the dust and the dirt from years and years of stuff breaking down has just kind of silted into the creek channel. And of course, there's no actual water flow going through the creeks to keep them defined. So at this point, do they still exist? They do, but the bass don't usually use them as much as they used to in previous decades, but it's still good to know that they are there. Now, one thing to understand about creeks is that they swing even far underneath our bodies of water. And so by knowing where the creek channel is swinging to, you can usually pick the best place to fish by the outside of that swing. So sometimes a creek channel can swing on the outside of a main lake area, and that's a good spot to fish when the fish are on uh, maybe a, a suspending bait fish pattern. Other times though, kind of off the main lake in what we call the creeks themselves. Again, if a creek is called, let's say Sandy Creek, back in the day, that whole area of the lake is usually called Sandy Creek, even though maybe just one of the arms actually has the Sandy Creek down deep on it. We kind of call that whole area the creek. And so sometimes the creek channel, I'm thinking about Toledo Bend, will run against a point 
that's inside that creek. That's gonna be a high percentage place to fish. Anywhere you can find the creek channels that swing into something is gonna be a good place with quick deep water access, but also shallow water access. Again, bass like to be able to trans transition quickly between the two, and so fishing there, I don't care what time of the year it is, is a great place to be. Now, if you're fishing a small body of water, you may not quite know where the original creek channel was before they flooded that thing, whether it's a, a neighborhood pond that may not have very defined creek channels, really, if any at all, and small neighborhood lakes that may have small creek channels. But over time, by fishing with lures like crankbaits and jigs and Carolina rigs, you may be able to find the deep sections. And if you catch bass in a certain area where it looks like the water could be flowing in, that's probably the old creek right there, and you found yourself a creek channel. So again, I apologize if that was a little bit of a ramble, but creek channels are extra important. You got to know about them. The next thing is going to be pockets, also known as coves, depending on where you're from in the country, are little indentations in your body of water that you're fishing. They could be a little indentation off the main lake, as you see here, or they could be a small cut uh, inside of an actual creek itself. There's kind of some, again, some variance. What's a pocket? What's a creek? In my experience, if I can get my boat or my kayak in an area and fish it within less than an hour, it's probably a pocket that is a relatively small little cut, but bass love pockets, especially during the spawn. Now, the next thing that I was so confused about for many years in bass fishing that oftentimes coincides with the creek channel is a drain or a ditch. Those two terms are synonymous. And what a drain or a ditch is, is the center line of a pocket. So something that sticks out from the main body of water, there's going to be, hopefully, when the water floods in, a drain line where you can see fresh water coming in. Now, depending on the body of water you're on and kind of, again, the topography of the surrounding countryside, you may not have very defined actual wa water inflows when you have rain that comes in. But in most, I'm going to say 90% of bodies of water, there's going to be places that form a drain. Just like a drainage ditch on land for uh, the, the side of the highway that directs where water flows to make sure it goes the right direction. Almost every lake, especially man-made reservoirs, will have drains and ditches that are usually 1 to 15 feet of water is where the water will have kind of formed a little ditch and fish, especially in the winter and pre-spawn, and sometimes summertime, will sit inside or on top of those drains and ditches. And don't just think this is a bass boat on a lake thing. There are plenty of ponds out there that because of rainwater have drain and ditch areas, and bass will oftentimes stack up in those areas. Now going far away from a drain or a ditch, the next thing is going to be a flat. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a flat area underneath the water. It could be one foot deep. It could be 25 foot deep. It just has to be a relatively large, expansive area underneath the water that is totally flat. There is almost no topographic change. There's no ledges, no drop-offs, no shelves, no humps, no points. It is just a big flat area. In my experience, fishing flats is a very hero or zero way to fish. So you're not going to have bass that are just littering a flat. I'm talking about every direction you cast, you catch a bass. That is hardly ever the case. Sometimes a grass flat is grass that's growing kind of to the same level on top of a flat that's underneath the water. That can actually hold bass kind of regardless where you cast, but there will be better casts, better areas to make. It's not just fishing over the whole thing and you catch bass over the whole thing. That is rare. But the biggest bass I've ever caught lived on flats, usually on some piece of structure on a flat. So maybe on the flat you have a brush pile, or on the flat you have a small little rock vein. I wouldn't really call it a point or an underwater old roadbed before, again, they flooded the lake. There was a road they used to run through there. Those are excellent places to fish because the entire flat has nothing and then there's something right there, the bluegill, the crappie, the bait fish, and therefore the bass love to sit on those things right there. So if you want to fish very high percentage pieces of structure, make sure to find them on flats. And the very opposite bass fishing term when it comes to flats is going to be bluff walls. Bluff walls can be anything from, I'd say, 
a 65 degree bank to a total 90, sometimes even an indentation bank. Let's call that like a little cliff edge uh, or a cave edge. Those are what's called bluff walls. And bass don't sit on these things all the time. That's mostly a summer or a winter thing, not a fall or a spring. Although I'd say fall more than spring. Bass are hardly ever on bluff walls in the spring. It's probably not worth your time. I'm comfortable coming out and saying that. But fishing bluff walls is so much fun because you can get your body if you're bank fishing, maybe a quarry type body of water, or you're in a kayak or a boat, you can get as close as you can to that bluff and cast parallel down it, making the furthest cast possible. And bass are going to be either sitting in and around different types of rocks that are on that bluff, or they're going to be suspending in the water column, chasing bait fish. And so a jerk bait, Alabama rig, a swim bait, a drop shot, anything that's kind of in that water column is going to be great to fish around bluff walls. Now, something that changes with a bluff wall is called a bluff end. You see it here on the screen. It's where the bluff wall ends. Now, why Tyler do bass like to sit on bluff ends? Because bass also like transitions of any kind. That is our next word. A transition is the change from one type of usually a bottom composition to another. Sometimes it can be grass to rock. So that is one type of structure to another type of structure. But most of the time, a transition applies to a bottom composition change. So you have a uh, chunk rock to mud. You have mud to sand. You've got open water to all of a sudden a big shelf comes up and then you have rock right there. To be honest, that's a transition in itself from no structure to structure. And I mentioned rock a second ago. Let's talk about our next bass fishing term, which is the different styles of rocks. I'm going to go small to big. Small rocks, mud, which is basically, I mean, technically, if you were to like compact mud over a period of time, it would turn into rocks. That's the smallest. Then you have sand, gravel, small rocks, also known as riprap, boulders, and then slate rock. I don't think I'm missing any kinds, but in, in my head, that's all the different types of rock. And so a transition again can happen when it goes from sand bottom to gravel bottom or small rock to all of a sudden big boulders. The transition areas between different types of rock is the best place to catch a fish underwater on the bottom. I am convinced by it. But just like everything else in bass fishing, you've got to figure out on your body of water what type of structure or what type of bottom composition the bass on that type of day are sitting on in order to cast in the right places to catch fish. So that's all the different types of rocks. Then we have different types of wood. So you have standing timber and you have laydowns. Now, in my opinion, standing timber is harder to fish than laydowns are. And the reason I say that is because standing timber usually has less stuff for the fish to actually sit on when it comes to bass. Crappie and, uh, and, and bluegill, I have found other panfish, those are better on standing timber than on laydowns. But bass, at least in my opinion, in the places I fished around the country, are easier to catch around laydowns because there's just more stuff horizontally for the bass to sit underneath. But you can catch fish on both of them. And to be honest, a lot of the same lures work for both. So on a laydown, I'll pitch a jig. On a standing timber, I will pitch or cast a jig, but some don't work. So an Alabama rig cast to the side of a piece of standing timber can get a suspending fish, again, suspending on that tree in the water column to come out and eat it. Same thing with a jerk bait or a swim bait. I will never throw an Alabama rig, a jerk bait, and most swim baits, again, on a jig head around a lay down log. That is just not smart. It is the fastest way to get your lure snag to cast it in that environment. But you've got to know bass live on both of those lay downs, generally being uh, shallower than standing timber. And so you just got to understand based on the time of the year where the bass are supposed to be, either in deep water or shallow. And that will make the choice between lay downs and standing timber if your lake's got both a little easier. Now let's move on to the next term, which is my favorite term in bass fishing, and that is boat docks. Boat docks hold bass all year long. I don't care how shallow or deep they are. They are bass fishing habitat 101, and I have caught 
probably a thousand plus bass on boat docks over my years of bass fishing. But there are two different types of boat docks. You've got floating boat docks and you've got stationary. Now, floating are usually in much deeper water than stationary ones are because stationary, you can only anchor the, the, the dock to the bottom or roll it out there on rollers in like less than 10 feet of water. And so floating docks in rocky highland um, Ozarks type reservoirs, floating can be anywhere from four feet of water um, I guess, you know what, they could be a one foot of water, but like one to five is kind of the shallowest a floating dock is usually sitting in. And the end of the floating dock could be in 40, 50, 60, 100, even more feet of water because again, they're floating. So it makes floating ones a little bit harder to fish. There's less areas to actually skip your lures underneath them and or as far underneath them until your lure smacks into a float. And then skipping underneath where a boat is sitting is just dangerous. I wouldn't recommend it. And so stationary boat docks, in my opinion, are the ones that are more fun to fish. They hold more bass because bass are generally wanting to be a shallow water creature. And stationary docks are in shallower water. And so therefore, stationary docks are going to hold more bass. Now, floating docks, lures like swim baits and flukes and drop shots, maybe finesse jigs, are great ones to throw around the edge and underneath the stairs. Of, of floating docks. But stationary docks have a much larger range of lures you can throw. I would still recommend a Texas rigged stick bait or a jig. And I throw a jig 90% of the time under stationary docks and learning to flip, I guess learning to pitch, sorry, and skip a lure underneath there is gonna be the best way to catch a bass, especially when the sun is high. If you don't fish boat docks and you've got them, even one as you're bank fishing a body of water, make sure to make a few casts over there or a few skips underneath before you ever step foot to actually fish from the docks surface. And that brings us to the last term of bass fishing that I wanna talk about in this video, and that is grass, also known as weeds, also known as aquatic vegetation, whatever you call it, where you're from and your body of water, it is stuff that is usually green, I guess I would say, that serves as a habitat for bass. It could be structure, as in stuff down on the bottom, or the grass could be shallow enough or growing high enough that it becomes cover. And let me tell you, there are tons of different types of grasses. You've got stemmed grasses like hydrilla, coontail, milfoil, the list goes on. And you've got leafy grasses like American pondweed, eelgrass, and I guess lily pads, even though those might not technically be a leafy grass per se, I'm gonna throw them in that category of leafy grasses. Which one do I like to fish around more? Sometimes I don't have a choice. I would rather though fish around stemmed grasses. They are easier to get your lures out of than leafy grasses, but they can all hold bass and they all have topography in themselves. So grass will have edges, it'll have depressions, it'll have big holes where there's actually no no grass growing in the entire hole through that hole is the bottom of your body of water and then they have topped out grass that means topped out means the grass has reached the top of the water and usually fallen over and you can throw topwater frogs you can throw a punch rig or a jig into that grass to go through it to the habitat underneath grass is a fantastic place to catch fish and if you can have grass mixed together two different types of grass lily pads and hydrilla you can have grass around boat docks grass mixed with lay down logs any kind of combination again transitions differentiations those kinds of things are what bass love and grass is probably the number one habitat for bass around the country. Well, my goodness, folks, notes turned off. That was a lot of dang terms. Hopefully I didn't miss any, although I probably did. It's bass fishing. There's more stuff to learn. But if you want to become a better bass fisherman, understanding what all of these mean and going into a deep dive for yourself on each one of these can definitely help you understand your bodies of water better and catch more bass. Now, if you want to watch a video that goes over my detailed masterclass on fishing grass, I will leave it up here and a detailed masterclass on actually selecting the right color of your lure. I'll leave that over here. My name's Tyler. As always, it's a pleasure, and we'll see you guys next time right here on TRF.